Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, I'm Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 700 of them now. Um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible through, through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there are PayPal buttons on the website. <clears throat> My guest today is Lorna Byrne. Lorna is a spiritual teacher and international best-selling author who has dedicated her life to reminding humanity of the spiritual potential within us all. She is the author of seven best-selling books, including Angels in My Hair and A Message of Hope from the Angels, both of which I've read, and Angels at My Fingertips, and has been published in more than 50 countries and 30 languages around the world. Her teachings are the result of a remarkable gift, a divine connection providing her with incredible detailed knowledge of the spiritual side of life. Unlike others, this gift is not from meditation, visualization, or even from books or study. It exists as a natural part of her waking life. Lorna Byrne has physical sight of the unseen world of the angels, the spirits, and other spiritual beings that she says are guiding and teaching us every second of every day. Lorna says we all have this potential, and it is part of humanity's evolution for people to connect back to their spiritual self so the body and soul intertwine. Lorna's vision of the future is one where there is no division or boundaries between people, where our spiritual side is accepted and transcends all beliefs, to accept that we are all one, to live in peace with each other and nature, our home. Lorna is also a philanthropist and founder of the Lorna Byrne Children's Foundation, helping vulnerable and marginalized children across, across the globe, and the Seraph Foundation, which is developing a sanctuary at her center in County Kilkenny, Kilkenny in Ireland. Um, okay, that's the introduction. So, Lorna, my first of many questions okay. <laughs> uh, is... Um, do angels guide you while you're being interviewed? If I ask you a question and you're not quite sure the answer, do angels often chime in with the answer you need? Um, yes, they do chime in, but not always will they let me even answer sometimes a question, but that seldom happens, so don't worry. <laughs> okay. So in other words, they might sometimes say, no, you sh we're not going to, you yeah. shouldn't answer yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That reminds me of a friend of mine who saw angels, and um, one time he, we were in an elevator, and I, I asked if he saw any in the elevator, and he just smiled. But when we got off, he said, they just said to me, don't point us out to people. If they're meant to see us, they'll see us. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, they, angels can be um, very cheerful as well, you know, funny as well. They're not all the time, you know, serious. I heard you say they have a sense of humor. Can you give us an example of some funny encounters you've had with angels? Well, I, I suppose maybe, uh, you know, sometimes when I'm feeling myself a bit down, um, you know, angels will just start dancing around me or they might say something funny. Um, but sometimes when I see that someone else is down, I would often see the angels, how would I say it, you know, holding a light in front of them you know, to help them to see the light. Mm. But sometimes, how can I, I, I don't know how to describe this. I would see the angels, you know, reach out to touch them. Now, this wouldn't be their guardian angel, reach out to touch them. Um, and sometimes I would see suddenly somebody would look up and give a smile. So I know whatever they were doing, you know, helped to cheer them up. They're always... Um, helping to cheer us up and sometimes you know a guardian angel will get someone else to say something kind or funny to someone that is feeling down and that's all part of the interaction with the angels as well and the human being nice um we i mentioned in the introduction that i read that you know you see various subtle beings and ireland of course is famous for elves and leprechauns and things like that i mean do you sometimes see those little characters and do they they're kind of notorious for being mischievous and playful and well i i, I suppose ireland has a, a great celtic you know tradition in that way about you know the little people and i guess where all of that came from as well was you know before 
the first people came to Ireland, there was already people living on this land, but they were very tiny. And we still have some people, like I'm only barely five foot, Mm -hmm. but there's still some people fully grown and they're smaller than me, you know, in that in that way. And yes, they're always very cheerful. Kind of like the Bushmen of South Africa, small people. You know. Yeah. Um, So your books had a a lovely effect on me. Um, I felt as I was listening to them, I listened to them in audio, uh, that the they conveyed the purity and innocence that someone must have in order to have the kind of perception that you have. And and that had a it felt like it had a enhanced my own purity or my own innocence a little bit to to hear the books. Um, So that was lovely and um but i think for many people you know many people are cynical and and the world appears bleak and lifeless and meaningless and dead and gray and depressing and so on um have you ever gone through a phase where it appeared that way to you or has your subtle perception always made it appear divine um ultimately even if you're going through difficult times um well many a time you know i went through a very very hard time you know, and I would feel down and I would give out to God and the angels, but always my prayers were answered. I always got the help in the end, even though it was extremely hard. It's like one Christmas, literally having nothing from Santa Claus for the children. And out of the blue, like you would say to yourself, how could that happen? A car on my way home, you know, as I was pushing one of my sons in the pram, you know, pulled in and stopped and just said, we have some toys here in the boot of the car and we're trying to get rid of them. Would you like them? Nice. Yeah, I remember that from your book. (laughs) And just, yeah, just took them, you know. And, And I suppose one thing I've always taught my children is, well, because of that day, I would say to to them, try and be Santa Claus for someone else. In that way. So God and the angels help us all all of the time. And I know for me, this is all normal. You know, I don't know what it's like for for you. Like if I go out in the street I and see somebody walking down the street, I will see the angels with them and maybe even the soul of a loved one. But it's normal. Um, I, I don't know what it's like for you just to see only the human being as such, and not to see the angels as well physically or the soul of a loved one. Now, I can't see your angel, you know, on on the screen. That rarely happens. You can or cannot? I cannot. Okay, I I was going to ask you that. Do you see them over Zoom and things? (laughs) No, no, that that would very rarely happen. Mm -hmm. That would happen very rarely. And But I I know if I was ever out on the street, you know, or walking somewhere or in another country, you know, I've been in so many places and everywhere I have been, I have seen the guardian angel with every single human being. Yeah. And and to me, that's a great comfort. And I, I just say some people would say to me that it's a great comfort to them as well, you know. Everybody has a guardian angel, you know, that beautiful guardian angel that never leaves them for one second at all. And I just love the way our guardian angels love us unconditionally, you know, Mm -hmm. and don't judge us. Even if, even if you're doing something that's, that's wrong, your guardian angel won't judge you, but it'll try and what would I say, influence you not to do what is wrong. Yes. Um, I have a lot of questions about that. Let's see now. Eh, this, I'll ask this question. This is somebody's question. I'll ask it in a few minutes. Um, so let's try to establish a definition of what an angel is. Um, my understanding is that creation exists in layers or strata or dimensions from gross to subtle to transcendent, and that angels would dwell in some level of the subtle dimension, but still be able to perceive and interact with our gross reality. Is that your understanding or is that correct? Um, I to me it wouldn't be my understanding in the, in that in that way because you have to remember I'm dyslexic I haven't been educated probably like yourself so I don't read or anything like that because I can't do that and I never have um 
when people used to ask me about the guardian angels and all angels, I used to feel a bit embarrassed, not not for people, but for the angels themselves, because what I was told to say was that God created angels long, long ago. Um, I don't know how long ago, um, and that they are creatures. They're not like us. It's, you know, we we have this soul and the angels have us on a pedestal, you know, way above them, where humanly we always put the angels on a pedestal in that in that way. And that is because we have a soul, that spark of light of God. That's the only difference I know between angels, ourselves, and God, because that's the way I was told to say it, that angels were created long, long ago, and that they're not like us, you know, and to call them creatures. So I don't know why that word, that, you know, um, and that was the word that, I was embarrassed about to say of of hurting the angels, if you understand. I didn't want to hurt them. but didn't want to hurt their I feelings must, or something. Yeah, but I was told I must say it. Mm-hmm. So I only can tell you what I know. I can't tell you anything else. Um, and and I know in a sense what you're, you're saying is like layers and layers in that way. I never see it that way. That's the difference. I never see it that way, even with um, Archangel Michael. I, I know he's in charge of a lot of things, but I never see Archangel Michael, or I have never seen any angel, um, what would you say, being authoritative to another angel. It's like, all I can say is, in one sense, it's like there's such peace and love, so much understanding. There's it's not like the way our world is, the way we are. I'm the boss. You're to do what I say. You know, you're not good enough. There, there's none of none of that at all. And to right. me, that is incredible. Yeah, they just play their roles naturally, I guess, and uh, each in its place. And nobody has to push them around for them to do the yeah, right thing. It, yeah. it, I have never, never seen that. So I, I can't. I can't agree with someone or or anyone that might say, well, you know, it must happen that way. But I suppose we look on everything in a human way. Yeah. So you mentioned that, you know, angels consider humans superior to them because we have yeah. souls and they don't. And you also say that animals don't have souls. And um, I guess maybe we should define what a soul is before we go on. Um, well, the only way I can define it for you is that a soul is that spark of light of God. Um, and it's it's so, so tiny. You know, it's like a spark off a piece of wood or a piece of turf. It's really, really tiny. And yet it fills every part of us and it's out there. And it's it's like for that reason that angels have awesome pedestals and why your guardian angel doesn't leave you for one second and why it's the gatekeeper of, of your soul. It never, never leaves you. And why other angels even love to come and go to give you a helping hand in, in other ways. And I know it upset people a huge amount when I said, you know, sometimes somebody would ask me, you know, I loved my dog so much. It must have a soul. It gives me so much love and affection. And your dog doesn't have a soul. And I, I know that's very upsetting for people. But if you love that animal dearly, God will have it in heaven for you when your time comes because you loved it. And we have taught animals how to, how would you say, I, I'd watch a person, it's lovely to see, you know, give love to an animal. You know, it's like this radiant light comes from a person. And it's just so beautiful to watch an animal give it back in that in that way. And we have to remember that creation is still happening and God is still creating. So if God at any time wanted every animal in the world to be in that place we call heaven, it's just a word we use, heaven, um, I know then that would be so. Hmm. So, but angels... 
th- they are sentient beings of some kind. They ha- they are conscious. They perceive. Yeah. They have senses yeah. of humor. They have personalities, and so on. Um, so and and God is all pervading. Is 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 it not? Or is well, he not? I- uh, I I have only ever God has ever only shown me is love, sure. Literally yeah. only love and mm-hmm. you know compassion and everything like that and and there are the gifts that every human being today in the world are looking for you know for that compassion for that love for that hope for that peace and I say to everyone everyone has all those things inside of you because of your soul but we can't go into a supermarket to buy them they're not for sale right so you you in a sense have to love you so you can love others now i know you respect different traditions and religions and and you do say that perhaps the time will come when all religions are just completely harmonious with one another um but obviously traditions different religious traditions have different teachings. In some traditions, it's thought that souls actually evolve from lower life forms, such as animals, to higher, like humans. And and some people believe that, um, you know, so Hinduism and Buddhism believes in reincarnation, and some people believe that reincarnation was um, part of Christianity in the early days. And um, so, how do you reconcile differences of teachings in different religions uh, like like this is do you have a sort of a firm belief that it has to be you know this way or do you feel like some a little bit theoretical about some of these ideas um, and i i suppose i i can only all the time tell everyone what god and the angels have taught me mm-hmm. you know i i can't do any more and and yet i would have you know all all different faiths come to talks you know um, even Buddhists and all, because I can remember them in, in the audience and, and they still come up for the blessing and everything like that, all diff- different faiths. And I think that's wonderful because we all have to come together, regardless yeah. of what our beliefs are. You know, um, so I never, I would never say to anyone, you know, don't, you know, put your beliefs to one side. You know, I would never condemn anyone if that's what they believe now. I can only give the message and then it's up to yourself, you know, in time. Like I, I've had many um, priests and sometimes bishops and sometimes imams and sometimes I don't know all the names of the different religions, you know, ministers and all come and ask me a question that. I actually got a terrible shock when they asked. And that was when they asked me, was God real? Even though they were priests or ministers or something. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) rabbis. And I I know there's there's loads of names and imams. and Right. So they had doubts. Yeah. And I couldn't. I, I was shocked the first time I was asked that because I felt, but aren't you, you know, the head of, you know, a particular religion? Surely you know God is real, you know, in that in that way. They would just ask, Lorna, is God real? And I have to say to you, yes, no matter what you believe, God is real. Sometimes God is portrayed uh, in a way that might be hard, might actually shake people's faith because they, they feel like, well, if God is all compassionate and loving and how could he be killing all these people or, you know, doing things like that? So maybe that's what creates doubts in some of these people. I I think, yeah, that would create doubt, but you have to remember that one thing, and that is that it's not God that's killing all those people. It's ourselves us humanly are doing it. Who is well, you know, stories like Sodom and Gomorrah where the whole city gets wiped yeah. out and stuff like that. Well, that, that I have answered partly of that. I think it is in Angels at My Fingertips or Stairways to Heaven where I talk about um, the way I put it for it to be understood humanly, the old God and the new God. And the old God is, you know, God doing all those kind of, kinds of things, trying to guide man to be better than, than we are. And, and then the new God in the sense, Jesus coming or who, whatever name you want to give God, 
another part of God coming to help us to to love each other a little bit more, you know, to show us the light in that in that way, to understand us. And I, I remember when I had written about that, um, again, a lot of priests and, you know, from all different religions came along and said, Lorna, we thought God knew everything. And I said, God does, but he finds it hard to understand us. You know, it's the understanding. It's it's like, you know, he, he sent another part of himself, Jesus, to understand us a little bit more and to leave us with a little bit more of love and compassion. That, in a sense, all the wrongdoings, all the killing and and the force are wrong. If we could love each other, we could reach for peace. We could come together as one. Perhaps it's hard for God to understand us the way it's hard for a parent to understand a rebellious teenager. Why are they acting so crazy? <laughs> <laughs> and I think every every parent goes goes through that with a teenager, you know, because again, I love the way you said that we are children, right. you know, even though we think we're we're adults and and we are children, and in right. a sense, we have in the world today just become what would you say, so concerned and pushed forward to, you know, go after all of the material things. But it's like as if the world is waking up a bit and saying it's not all about material things. It's it's about, you know, love and hope and compassion. It's about enjoying life, you know, feeling, you know, the air, the rain, smelling the flowers like I I have met so many people that have come to Ireland and even children and just seeing them what would you say the teenagers and everything like that out in the fields doing things you know they always turn around and say this is the best time of my life it's like as if suddenly you know going out into nature they're opened up in a way and you know they're they're more connected to nature and to to themselves in that in that way. I think we have lost a lot in the world today that we only see all the negative, you know, all the dread. Because so many people, again, I've met are are full of fear because of all the what would you call climate change and everything that is ha- that is happening and and governments and. And job loss and, you know, the lockdown that we we have had, you know, and I know the lockdown was really hard and so painful for so many families. But I know God and the angels were there all of the time. And that's that's what we have to have to remember. And I know it was hard, extremely hard, because I know so many families that lost loved ones and suffered hugely. Um, but lots of good has come out of that too. We have to see the good as well, you know, and I think we find it hard to see see the good. Like the only thing I can say when, you know, I'm on a farm lane here and sometimes I could look out the window and I could see some people passing. And now everybody, more so than, be- than before, say hello to each other and stop and greet each other. Because during the the lockdown, you only could go so far. And of course, you loved to talk to someone, to meet a neighbour. And I think that has brought a lot of joy to people's lives. Like I know an elderly lady and her daughter, and nobody would have spoken to, to them. You know, you'd very seldom see anyone stop and say hello. But since the pandemic, everyone stops to say hello. Mm, that's nice and talk to them for a few minutes and just to watch their guardian angels and and sometimes unemployed angels come and and surround them you know is just beautiful as well so perhaps some tension was dissolved in the collective consciousness during that period and people are a little bit more uplifted now i know one thing that happened here in the states is that a lot of people when they had to start working from home they they thought, wait a minute, why am I sitting in that cubicle five days a week? You know, I don't like it. You know, I like this better. And they a lot of there were a lot of job changes and lifestyle changes and all kinds of things that you know that brought about. And that's good. Yeah. Good, good as well. 
Um, one question that popped into my mind is, let's say that there are some people in India or someplace like that who also have your kind of a perceptual ability. Do you feel that perhaps your angels present things to you in a certain way because you have a Christian upbringing and their angels might present things in a way that's compatible with their Hindu or Buddhist upbringing? Um, and that that's per perfectly appropriate because that that's the culture in which you were raised and in which you function. Um, that's a lovely, a lovely question. And I'm asking the angels, is mm -hmm. that, you know, is that so? And the only answer I'm getting is partly. Okay. Partly. Can they elaborate? No, they're not elaborating. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> okay. So sorry. They're just saying, <laughs> saying partly. You know, um, and I, I know I have been invited to go to India to give talks as well, but it's so far away. Mm. Um, that's the only thing that turns me off going as as such. Mm. Um, but I have met many people from India that have come to Ireland or have come to other parts of Europe to see me as well. Um, and it's such a huge country. It is. It's, I think you'd enjoy the trip. Um Maybe you can get them to get you a business class seat so you can sleep during the flight. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll have to. I'll have to work on it. That's so so that it might happen on some occasion. We'll just have to wait and see. I always say everything is in God's hands. Sure. I I don't I don't um, you know I don't plan things. You know when when God said to me, you know, as a child to keep it a secret, you know. It was only as time went on that I understood why they were saying keep it a secret. And that was because, you know, my parents and that and all the adults around um, considered me retarded, you know, in that in that way. Um, and I'm severely dyslexic. So I have never planned any, anything. Just God and the angels all my life have told me, you know, they used to say, Lorna, one day you will write. You know, as a child, they would say that, and I couldn't even write my name. Even as a teenager, they said the same thing. And as an adult, and even when I got married, of course, I had to learn to write my name then. But it's still very hard to do so. And I would get my children to write the notes for the school teachers, and I would sign it. <laughs> you know, I, I would sign it. Um, and, and to me, the most incredible thing is that everything that God has said would happen in my life has happened. Like, I'm I'm actually still in shock that the book Angels in My Hair happened, you know, and, and that it became a bestseller and that I'm sitting here now talking to you. Like, that's, wow, that's incredible. Like, um. I, my mind and myself is still be blown away every day with with what's with what's happening. But I always say to everyone, it's not about me at all. It's about you, and I'm not the important one. I'm nothing. You're the important one. You know. Um, sometimes I don't even know how to explain that, but. When you can't read or write, you know, what a gift you have, you know, because you can read and write, you know, um, I would love to be able to pick up a book and read it. And I love books. If I see a shelf full of books, I'll go over to them and pull them out and feel them and, you know, go through the pages, you know, in that in that way. Um, I'm just sharing that, that with you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Um... Well, firstly, Angels in My Hair was a lovely book. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And it, even though it was autobiographical, it wasn't all about you. It was really, a, it conveyed a teaching in every passage. And uh, and one thing just to mention in passing is that both your childhood and your married life were really quite impoverished financially. Um, it wasn't easy. And um, so... I'm really glad that you did write the book and that it kind of lifted you out of poverty um, because you deserve it. And, and the book is having a, a wonderful effect on people all over the world. And to, to me, that is the most important thing that it's, it's helping people. And, 
you know, I, I hear from people all of the time and, and they keep telling me it has changed their life. It yeah. has given them a new perspective on on life. And and even when I hear on the news about the homeless and those hungry, I understand that because I was homeless. You know, I know I put it in the book, you know, in a little bit in that in that way, and it mightn't even have been noticed. But I even know what it's like to be hungry. You know, and I, I think so many of us nowadays, because of there's so much going on in the world and there's, you know, so many food banks now to help families. But I still think that a lot of people don't realize what it is like to be hungry, thinking of what can you put on the table for your children and you don't eat yourself, you know, um, of what you can put on the table for your husband because he's a diabetic and he has to have, or he'll go into a hypo or something like that. You know, I and this is why I, I think, you know, we we have to reach out and realize that, you know, we have a soul and a guardian angel and, and that God is real so that we can grasp, if you like, onto that hope you know, have that faith. And it doesn't matter what religion you are or, or whether you belong to none in that way or whether you say, I believe in nothing. But we we all need hope in our life. We all need to have that faith that we will get through it and that someone, you know, will give us a helping hand. And I often say, you know, it doesn't have to cost you much to give someone a helping hand. You know, the angels are always telling people, you know, to give that smile or to open that door to show kindness. But sometimes we're so hurt ourselves, you know, that we're, you know, all enclosed like this, you know, because we're so hurt and we're saying to ourselves, well, no one has helped me, so why should I help anyone else? But you have to, in that enclosed with your arms around you like that, try and love you. So you can help someone else. And so you can help yourself, you know, because it brings light and love into your life in that in that way. And I know everyone can do it. And that's why you have this beautiful guardian angel that never leaves you for a second. And I always remember being asked the question, um, Lorna, do you mean in the bathroom as well? And I said, yes, <laughs> because the angels don't look on us in the same way as we look on ourselves. Um, and, and it was lovely to, what would I say, to hear the laughter when when I answered that question, just as you laughed that time. Yeah, I actually have a whole list of questions about guardian angels that I want to get to. But um, let me um, pop in a few questions from the audience that came in. So one is from Catherine Martin in Arles, France. She says, I've been seeking for a few years, making a sincere effort. If someone is seeking for their angel but not having any results, what is the best way to proceed or persist? Could my head be too full of interviews and reading? Should I stop seeking and let go? Why does it happen to some people seemingly out of nowhere? Um, that is, that's, maybe she's trying too hard. Maybe she should just stop everything for a moment you know, in that sense. And I always say to everybody, you know, what have you got to lose? You've nothing to lose. And just to believe your guardian angel is there and talk to your guardian angel, ask it for guidance to show you what way to go. I always say, you know, your guardian angel can teach you so many things. It could, if my guardian angel said to me, Lorna, now pick up this glass. So I picked it up. My guardian angel didn't say that, okay? It's only teaching you. Your guardian angel will never ask you to do anything wrong, but it's just teaching you how to respond. And I would say to that lovely lady, ask for a sign, something simple. Most people will ask for a feather or a flower. And I have seen so many times where, you know, a person finds a feather in an unusual place. It's not that they're going down the road and there's loads of birds there and there's feathers all over the place. You know, sometimes it can be in a drawer. Sometimes, you know, they find it in their house. Sometimes, 
You know, I remember one lady saying she found a feather in her shoe the first t- time in her life. You know, after having asked for one. After having asked for one, yeah. Right. You know, and and you would keep on asking, um, and sometimes somebody would ask for you know a bunch of flowers. That sometimes is hard, okay, because another human being has to respond and give you that bunch of flowers out of the blue. But I have often been shown where a child um, picks a little wildflower and goes over to a stranger and gives it to the stranger, but the stranger doesn't recognize that's the bunch of flowers, you know. So it's kind of be be open because, you know, you, your guardian angel could be saying to you, go and get Mary or John, you know, just say you're looking at some daffodils, you know, or you're passing a shop or, you know, there's a few daffodils in your garden and suddenly the thought comes into your mind about a neighbour and the flowers. You should pick two or three of them. It doesn't have to be a big bunch, you know, and give them to the person who came into your mind. Just say, here, these are for you, you know, because the angels, they often tell me they find it hard to get people to answer that request for another person. Always remember whoever you gave those flowers to, you probably saved their life, you know. So Um, you're saying that if a little thought like that pops into your mind, maybe I should give Mrs. Jones a flower. Yeah. It could have been planted by an angel in your mind. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, we don't do we don't do that enough. Um, it's kind of and and yet when if you receive something out of the blue from someone and you were feeling down, it would cheer you up and it would give you hope. It would help you to say to yourself, well, this good thing has happened to me today. Someone gave me a flower, you know, um, someone showed kindness and love towards me by just giving me the flower. And it could you could hand them to a stranger. It's like sometimes, you know, I was often at times back a few years ago sitting in a, a little cafe and, you know, having my cup of coffee or a cup of tea and then my guardian angel telling me on the way out, get another cup of coffee or tea. And I'd go out carrying this cup of coffee or tea and... You know, I would be saying to my girl, well, I don't really want it. Who is it for? And I could walk down the road quite, you know, I'm a fast walker. I seemingly that's what I've been told. I'm a fast walker. And then suddenly I might be told to turn left and I would see someone and just give them a cup of tea and say, this is for you. And it's not necessarily even a homeless person. It could be someone sitting on a bench. And you have given them a cup of tea and you just keep walking. You don't, you know, you don't sit down and start chatting. I would just give it to them and say, this is for you. Always remember, you know, we can save somebody's life. We can give them hope by just showing that little bit of kindness. You know, I I like many a time I would be shown so many things you know, and I would just go over and show that little bit of kindness and keep going then because I would know just that little bit of kindness has given somebody such an uplift. If one person can be kind to me today, maybe others will and I can be kind to others. Mm. It's like spreading, spreading the good, the love. Can we assume that our guardian angels read our thoughts routinely um, and therefore if we're cognizant that they're doing that we can assume that they know what what's going on with us or is it necessary to more specifically make an appeal of some kind you know a, a prayer or an uh, um, you know a statement or yeah. some kind of communication um they already know so i love the first part of your question they already know and But it's good for us, ourselves, for our human self, you know, I would often say, you know, to talk to your guardian angel or to write a letter to your guardian angel or to give out to your guardian angel to say, I need a helping hand. But they already know they're already working on trying to get that helping hand for you, get that guidance for for you. Um, Sometimes it is like, you know, 
maybe you're you're stressed or worried about your job or something like that and you just say come on guardian angel please give me a helping hand and maybe a thought comes into your head you know go and meet meet a friend a particular friend for a cup of tea and you go and meet them and then that gives you an opportunity to talk about the situation of your job because maybe that person is able to help to get you to focus or to help you to make the right decision. But another thing I always say to people, many, many a time, you know, you already know what's the right thing to do. But sometimes we we listen to everybody else, you know, and we go the way everyone else says. And afterwards we say to ourselves, I should have gone the other way. Mm-hmm. I knew it all the time. That was your guardian angel. So sometimes it's, it is hard for us humanly sometimes to figure out what's right. You know, what's the right decision to make? But just remember, if your guardian angel says to you, pick up that glass of water, even if you don't want it, pick it up. We're, we're in the habit of being lazy and not bothering, you know, um, or just say your guardian angel said to you later today, you know, it just came into your mind you should get up and go for a walk all that you have to do is get up and go for that walk whether it is just a two minute walk or a three minute walk it's just teaching you you don't ask why it's just teaching you it's just like you know a child never asks why it's been taught something it just keeps trying doing trying to do it until it can do it really well and I'd love everyone to get really good at that you know, because it makes life much easier. Of course, most people won't realize, oh, my guardian angel is asking me to take a walk. But, you know, what you're saying, I think, is that we should get in the habit of being aware of these subtle impulses, intuitions that that come to us and, um, you know, not ignore them, but realize that they could be coming from some guardian angel or some, you know, more divine level of awareness. And that if we kind of act on them perhaps it will become more habitual and our whole life will be guided that way yeah like uh, lots of people would often say to me Lorna I started practicing on on listening you know on that intuition of you know say going going for a walk or or going into a certain cafe and they would often say well I would never have met that person I met that was able to change my life or I was able to change theirs only for I listened, yeah. you know, in that in that way. So the angels are always guiding us. God is always guiding us. And I know at, at the moment, you know, lots of people might be feeling, you know, well, where's God in their life? Where's their guardian angel in their life? But your guardian angel is right there. And even the soul of your loved one is right there as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, this next question is from Irene. Um, If one fully believes in angels and other celestial beings and prays to them for help with something serious and yet nothing comes of it, what should one make of that? Are are they out there trying to get through, so to speak? Um, I I love the question. Um, What way will I answer that? I never pray to an angel, okay, or any any other, you use that word, I can't pronounce this. Um, I only pray to God and I only, in a sense, ask ask God and God all the time helps, but the angels help as well. You know, they they come with the messages for me at, at different, different times. And I know many people would pray and ask for, you know, it could be that you want your child to live or or you want, you know, someone to get better or or you want you know someone to be healed in some way or for yourself to be healed in some way and and you pray and pray and you ask and you don't get it you literally don't get it and you in a sense are angry and annoyed and and you say I don't believe anymore that's it but I've met so many people that have said that to me and they have said as well that they were glad they never got it because of where they are now. That's true. <laughs> you know, where yeah. they are now. If, if they had got that. And this is why I always say that 
God knows what's right for you. So if you don't get something, don't tear yourself apart over it. Just if you can, and I know sometimes it's hard, just let it go. Now, I depend. I know that depends on what it is. Just, just let it go. Because I know in the future, you'll be so glad that you didn't get it. But many people get what they pray for as well. You know, they get a good outcome. Something got sorted. But they played their part as well. I would often have somebody say, you know, I've been praying to God and asking God for, you know, romantic love. That's the most common one, you know, for love to come into my life or for a job. Um, but then you find they're not doing anything for that to happen. They're staying in behind the closed door. You know, I and I would say to them, well, that romantic partner is not going to come and knock on your door and say, hey, come out for a date. In that in that way, you you have to put yourself out there as well. You have to play your part. And the same for a job. You know, no matter how many times you're turned down, you still need to keep applying. But maybe, you know, sometimes I always remember this young man telling me that for, you know, he worked in a company for something like six years and then the company closed up and he started to apply for different jobs, kind of the same thing. And he said, Lorna, I wasn't getting any of them. And I was asking my guardian angel, what are you doing? You know, what's God doing? What's happening? And he just said then, then one day he was, I don't know, I can't remember what he was saying, what he was looking at. But he saw a job advertised for something completely different. And he knew nothing about it, he had no experience. But it was um, to do with, with um, forestry. I don't know exactly what it was, but he got the job and he's still in the job. He loves it, you know, so I'm sure he has been qualifying himself as time goes in. But sometimes, again, I think, you know, when you're looking for a, a particular job, sometimes maybe look a little left or a little right if you're not getting what, what you think you should only be getting because you could be brought in another direction. Yeah. The Rolling Stones sang, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. Exactly. You know, <laughs> you get what you need. And when you get what you need, it's much, much better by a million times than what, what you wanted yeah. or what you believed you wanted. I have a bunch of questions about what angels look like, but I don't think we have time to ask them all. So um, let, me just, or let me ask a couple of them. Um, what function do angels' wings serve? I've, I've heard you mention that they you know, you, they, many of the angels you've seen have wings, but they wouldn't need them to fly. Uh, I, I presume they could just float or hover if they wanted to. So why do they see many of them have uh, wings? That's that's a lovely, a lovely question, whoever sent it in. Uh, um, oh, it's one of my questions. <laughs> oh, one of your questions. It's actually, it's actually lovely because I don't always see wings. And that's something I always say. And when I do see wings, to me, it's like a privilege. I, th I think why angels have wings is because it's something that mankind way back put on angels. They don't need them. Uh, so that they, actually they relates to another question, which is that do they, do they kind of appear to people in a way that would make sense to people, such as having wings, but maybe that's not their real form a real appearance if they have a real appearance they, they just project an appearance that people can relate to yeah that that's why i i always say you know angels are a light and within that light they give a human appearance something that we would recognize so again it would be you know whatever tradition you're from the angel will give that appearance within that light as well i see yeah i heard you say at one point in your book that um Angels can appear very physical, such that everybody can see them. Like you were walking along with the, with the archangel Michael at, at a monastery, or a, yeah, and, 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 and the other the priest said uh, said hi to him. <laughs> but uh, you know, ordinarily 
ordinarily people couldn't see him. Yeah, I, I always remember that particular day, you know, being with Archangel Michael. I was in Maynooth College when um, a lot of priests were there at that time and young men training to be priests and the public could go in and walk around. But that, that particular day, I was with Archangel Michael and just seeing those two priests and they had prayer books in their hands, you know, and, you know, they said hello to Archangel Michael and he acknowledged them. But it was like as if I wasn't there. Yeah, they were probably, so, probably trying to be good priests and not look at the <laughs> women, you know. Well, they ignored me completely. <laughs> you know, I, I felt the invisible one. It was like as if, you know, I was made invisible and they just saw Archangel Michael. But yeah. the one thing I loved about Archangel Michael, he always dresses, if he makes himself so visible, he will dress in whatever others are dressed in. So he was dressed like priest. Uh -huh. So there was no no question. Yeah. Do angels always appear solid to you or are they somewhat ethereal or translucent? Like, could you see through them a little bit? Um, not, they're, they're translucent, you know, and I have talked a little bit about the depth of an angel as well. It's like as if you you could step into an angel and it will go on and on in, in that, that sense. They are translucent. Okay. Are they self-luminous? Could you see them in a pitch dark room or do you need some illumination of some I, kind? I love that question now that, that you're asking because um, I'm writing a book at the moment with a scientist uh -huh. and... Um, that was one of the questions he asked me. And I just said to him, God, I don't know. It has never dawned on me because no one has ever asked that. And that night I went to bed, the lights were off and I got under the blankets and I was tired and I just wanted to go to sleep. And the next minute, an angel puts its hand on my shoulder and I could see it clearly. Even though you and had your I eyes just, closed. Yes, even with my eyes closed. And I just said, go away and leave me alone. <laughs> Let me sleep. <laughs> you know, so it answered his question. Yes, in yeah. the dark, I, I can. And even with my eyes closed. So presumably, even if you were to go blind, you would still see them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, please, God, now I never go blind. <laughs> no, we don't want that to happen. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I think, you know, when you're talking about that, you know, um. I, I do believe I see through my human eyes, but I see through the eyes of my soul as well. It's like, how would I say, like as if, you know, the eyes of my soul are looking out through my human eyes. That's the only way I can explain. Yeah. Um, this is a good question from Cynthia Edwards in Santa Cruz, California. Um, you know how it is that people have all kinds of crazy thoughts pop into their heads and sometimes they act on them. And, uh, you know, and so her question is, how do you know it's your guardian angel asking you to pick up the glass of water or whatever and not your monkey mind playing games with you? Um, I, I suppose I would just say to her, the one thing to, to remember is that, you know, your guardian angel or any angel will never ask you to do anything wrong. So if you're being asked to pick up a glass of water, that's not doing anything wrong. Right. But if you're thinking of doing something wrong that might be spiteful or hurtful or you know anything like that that's not your guardian angel no that's and i have a section your human, of your human self right i do have a section of questions that hopefully we'll get to about good and evil and how there could be evil influences and so on um okay moving along there are, i've heard you mention a number of different kinds of angels and uh you know, we've talked about guardian angels quite a bit. We can talk more. There are unemployed angels, the angel of hope, an American gathering angels, uh, healing angels, archangels, um, so many different there, types. Uh, I, I always say there, I, I suppose like I see angels helping human beings and nature so much, you know, all, all of the time. Um, and, and to me, that is quite incredible. And the first time I was a child when I saw the unemployed angels. And the only way I can explain those angels is like, it's like as if 
sometimes when I would look up at the sky and I would be told to look up, it's like as if there is this big, huge, enormous bucket, you know, um, and the bucket always looks kind of like dark and silver. It's like, you know, the light of the earth reflecting on it. And it's like it's turned upside down. And I did just see these unemployed angels. It's like as if, you know, they're rolled up in a ball in that way. But as they're coming down towards the the earth, tumbling down, and then slowly as they get closer, um, just as they come to the earth, they, what would you say, unwind you know, they come out of that that ball, unwind, mm-hmm. and um, just stop. And that is beautiful to see because I see so many unemployed angels, and that's what I call them when I was a child, unemployed. So the name I have left the name, unemployed, but to see them there to help everyone. And one thing about the unemployed angels, and I have never said this, um. And I know it goes for all angels, but I see them helping everyone. You know, I would even see them, you know, helping. You know, I have often seen a, a group of un- unemployed angels around someone that who would be considered maybe not the best person, mm-hmm. you know, not a good person. And yet they would be there. That's what I love about angels. You know, they... <sighs> They help us no matter what, you know, and that's hard to explain. You know, it's kind of something that I I think is lacking us in us human beings as such. And yet I see see the angels and these unemployed angels. I always remember, you know, this young man and he, you know, he beating up somebody else and then somebody else gave him a belt and he fell. You know, and, you know, everybody kind of like, you know, screaming or or whatever. And and things happen so quickly. And yet unemployed angels just appeared from nowhere within seconds. And they were around him and around, around the others as well. You know, it was like there was no, you know, you're not worthy of help. Everybody was worthy of help you know, in, and, and I I suppose I would love to see more of that love and compassion in human beings. Um, and I, I always remember the young man was taken away in an ambulance and then somebody else that he had hurt was being attended to as well. But seeing the unemployed angels, you know, how would I say reaching out even to those that were helping the other the other person you know reaching out and touching them it was like as if you know they were helping to take away the pain and the heat you know and helping you know the medics to do what what they're meant to do in that in that way and I suppose you can ask for an unemployed angel for yourself but you can ask for unemployed angels for the stranger, the person you don't know either as well. And that's one thing I've always done with unemployed angels is ask them to go out into the world and help anywhere they possibly can. Um, Yeah. They're kind of like freelancers. They're, you know, we, yeah, we, they are. We, like we have our, our 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 own guardian angel is pretty yeah. much stuck with us. But there's we you know there's some guys that are on call to go and attend to certain yeah. situations. Yeah, <laughs> and I I would often see them. You know, you might I could be in Dublin or or a smaller city, and there's lots of people around going in different directions, and just seeing the unemployed angels weaving in in and out and among them. And then suddenly seeing an unemployed angel stop, you know. And once I saw an unemployed angel stop, I knew exactly what had happened. I knew that that person, no matter who they were or anything like that, had actually asked for a bit of help. And the unemployed angel just stopped to give them a hand, whatever it was, you know. One thing I find fascinating about all this is, if uh, let's say extraterrestrials were to land on the White House lawn, it would make a 
big splash. I mean, it'd be all over the headlines all over the world uh, because we think, oh, there are these forms of life that we didn't know about. And now, now we see them. But ironically, in the world is teeming with forms of life all around us that we are completely oblivious to. And, <laughs> and it doesn't make the news. Um, so it's, it's kind of fascinating I, that there's this whole, whole menagerie of, of subtle life forms everywhere. Uh, and most people are just totally unaware of them. Um, yeah, they are unaware of them, an awful lot of people. But I, I think a lot of people are becoming more and more aware. Like, because I, I find even when I'm with teenagers or, you know, if I was invited into a school or anything like that, you know, that even young people are more open than mm. we, we realize. Sure. You know? Not so, that they perceive them, but they believe them. Yeah, believe it. They, yeah, they believe they're there and, and they can tell you stories, you know, about how they have already helped them, mm -hmm. you know, in that in that way. OK, so we've established that everybody has a guardian angel um, and that, that I guess would mean that there are as many guardian angels in the world as there are people. Yeah, yeah. definitely. OK, yeah. and uh, so they're not unemployed. Um, and how is it determined who your guardian angel is going to be? Um, I have written, I think it is, in um, Angels at My Fingertips, I, I think I have talked about, I'm not quite sure which book, I, I give a little bit more information into um, each book as I go, go along, mm -hmm. but not too much because I don't want to overwhelm people. Um, but your guardian angel, um, when you were in heaven, when God created your soul, Okay, and you were in the Sea of Souls. I I was shown where the Sea of Souls has thousands of souls are there that have even to be born yet to come come into our world. And I was shown one particular soul standing there. And how would you say it? I call it the Sea of Souls and looking around and, and waiting, you know, for for the guardian angel to come. And it was like when the guardian angel appeared, that particular soul recognized and knew that was its guardian angel. And when they met, they embraced in, in love. And then I'm skipping some of it. And then at another stage, the guardian angel stood, I was shown in front of God with that soul. And God appointed that guardian angel there and then for that soul to be the gatekeeper of that soul. And at the very moment of conception, your soul came at that very, very moment um, when your mom conceived. Came into your, into, in, into a physical, into pain. Yeah. right? Not into, ex into existence or into your mom's into, body? Into your mom's body. Right, because right. Because it's, it's like it, it happens at the very moment of conception. So even at the very moment of conception, you're you're not a baby, you know, you're just tiny little little egg. Just a few cells, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a few little little things at that very, very moment. And and you knew before then, even, you knew everything that would happen within your life. But it's like you don't fully remember it, or sometimes you might have some little what would you call kind of tweaks? You might you might say, you know, oh, I knew that would happen, but that would have been your guardian angel guiding you as well, even as a little child. Hmm. Your guardian angels. Let's let's say someone has, another, you know, who was it? Henry De Henry David Thoreau said, "Most men lead lives of quiet desperation," and there are millions, billions of people in the world who have really tedious, boring jobs, you know. And um, obviously, guardian angels have a different mentality than humans because it's boring enough to have to do such a job, but to have to sit there and watch somebody do such a job would be even more boring. <laughs> so. They, 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 <laughs> Well, I, I know um, guardian angels don't get bored. Right, they couldn't. They, it would be a they, terrible they, job they, if they did. Yeah, <laughs> they don't get bored. But some people have often said to me, you know, their job is boring. You know, they don't like it. You know, they complain about it. And then I ask them the, the one question, well, what's the wages like? And many a time they turn around and tell me, well, the wages is great. 
And then I would say to them, well, then you shouldn't be bored of your job. You should do the best you can. And if you're getting a good wages, then that's giving you means to do other things that you yeah. would love to do. Well, the wages aren't always great, though. Somebody might well, work, know, be working in some sweatshop, yeah, you know. And yeah, I, I know, I know that as well. But you know, how would I say? Even when I worked in the school scrubbing the floors and that, it was it was literally only pennies. But the angels always taught me never to say I was bored or annoyed with the job because the money I received for doing that work and I would do the best I possibly could. Um, just meant so much, you know. So I know if if you're bored with your job, I know that can be hard, but maybe look at the positive things within it. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you feel you can get another job somewhere else, you know, go go and look. But don't leave your job till you have a job. Yeah. I don't want you out of, out of work, you know. I've heard stories, this is a, a bit of a, an abrupt shift here, but I've heard many stories of people, let's say, going into a bookstore and having a particular book just fall off the shelf in front of them, sometimes opening to a particular page that they need to see. Do angels do that sort of thing? They they actually can push a book off a shelf or something? Yeah, that does happen, you know, yeah. and I'm so surprised at that because I would never have been in a bookstore at all in my life until angels in my hair came out remember and i'm being told that story all over the world you know that angels in my hair or one of my books fell from a shelf right or or they walked into a shop and you know there was boxes on the floor and the top book was one of my books as such you know and they decided to pick it up and have and have a look. Yeah, I I hear that. Has that happened to you? Not so much, but I, I've had some things. I I'll, I'll tell you a really quick story. One time, um, I was in this facility. wasn't near a town. I, I needed a bunch of things. I got moved to a different room, and all the most of the things I needed were in that room. Uh, but I also needed some decorative shoe buckles that had broken off my shoes because they had gotten wet, and I put shoe trees in them, and they dried, and the buck, buckles broke off. So where would I get something like that? So I was walking to dinner in the evening, and um, I was passing a an air conditioner in the hallway and something caught my eye on top of the air conditioner. I looked up there and there was a pair of decorative shoe buckles that fit my shoes, not the ones I had that had broken off. So you little thing like that, you think, how did that happen? Who organized that? <laughs> well, all as all as I can say um, is the angels have organized it or maybe even the soul of a loved one, yeah. you know, again, giving you a sign and giving you hope. In, yeah. that, in that way you know you were going off for dinner who are you going to meet <laughs> I don't know um you know it's it's kind of so many strange things happen to us at different times um and a lot of the time you know even people have a spiritual experience but they think it's too strange and they're afraid to share it in case people laugh at them and ridicule them about it or say you're crazy you know, in that in that way. Um, you know, I, I remember one woman telling me, a young woman, you know, that um, her grandmother had died when she was a child. And, you know, she saw her grandmother, you know, walk into her bedroom and she was afraid to tell her mom or anybody else because she was afraid she'd be ridiculed. And she just said, my grandmom, walked into the bedroom. And at that time, she was going through a stressful time in school, you know, being bullied and everything like that. And she said she was just so nervous and full of anxiety. And her grandmother, she said the door opened, you know, the door opened and she looked up thinking it was her mom coming in and it was her grandmom and her granny came in and sat on the edge of the bed. She said it looked like as if she sat on the edge of the bed and she told me everything will be all right. Mm. I'm here with you. Yeah, but that she, reminds me. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. She was just afraid to share it with anyone. Until now, she's in her 50s. And now she shares it. Yeah. You know? I um, interviewed a woman named Pamela Wilson a couple of times. She's a friend of mine. And 
um, she had an experience when she was a teenager where she just had this burning desire to know the truth, you know, you know, what's, what's life all about? I, I'm just going to insist that that somebody come through this door and tell me what the truth is all about. So she, she went to bed and she woke up in the middle of the night and there was a little Indian man sitting on her bed and she threw a pillow at him. And, <laughs> and then later on, she saw a book that had a picture of Ramana Maharshi on the cover. And she said, that was the guy. Um, <laughs> and so, and that's, people have experiences like that with Jesus and all kinds of things. So I'm wondering like, is this uh, are these um, deceased saints actually visiting people or maybe it's an yeah, angel the assuming their appearance or something no it's the souls of our loved ones and sometimes you know a, a soul is sent to give someone guidance in in that way like for for your friend it's like you know this story i haven't told in a long time but many years ago i i met um this woman and she told me the story that when she was a child and she was in the back of the car with other siblings and her dad driving the car, um, they were in a crash. But in the crash, she said, we would have gone over the cliff. But she said, I saw an angel in front of the car with its hands on the bonnet, mm. this enormous angel that stopped the car. And she said she never shared that with anyone until later in life, you know, and again, so many things happen all of the time and we're afraid to share them. We shouldn't be afraid to share them because remember, when you share a story with someone, even if they don't seem to quite take you serious or maybe laugh at you a little bit or say, ah, oh, go away, you were, you, you, you were drinking or they'll say, you know, you were half asleep, but you have told, you have told them the story. And it's in their mind, you know, that can help them as well to open up spiritually in some way. You know, it's it's like we're we're afraid to, in a sense, to talk about our guardian angel, but we're even afraid to to say, I believe in God, or I believe in Jesus, or I believe in Allah. We're 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 afraid because we're afraid we'll be ridiculed. And we why should we be afraid? I don't understand that. Yeah. I know I get ridiculed and laughed at and I'm told I'm crazy, but it doesn't matter because I always remember saying to God, you know, when Angels in My Hair was written and it got out there into the world, you know, if it saved one person's life, that was it. My work was done. But God said, no, your work is not done. You know, so to me, if you save someone's life or, or you save a tree or, or you save a river or you save part of this life that's on our planet, this part of creation that is part of God, you know, life is well worth, worth it. It's, it's actually priceless. So why should we be afraid to say, well, I thank God today for everything, for all my blessings, regardless of what they were. Or you're leaving your job and you're saying, thanks be to God, that was a good day. And yeah. what does it matter if your co-workers hear you say that? Yeah, I've always enjoyed being a bit of an oddball and haven't cared too much what, <laughs> what people think about me. Maybe when I was a teenager, I was more self-conscious and lacking confidence. And yeah, I was more that way. But after a while, I just thought, to heck with it. I'm just going to be me. And, you know, it's kind of worked out. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think we all have to be ourselves. I love the way you brought it up, you know, be me. Um, and I think that's even important for teenagers to be themselves, not to try to be someone else in that in that way. And I always think it's very, very sad nowadays that, you know, in school, children have to be taught empathy. You know, they have to be taught how to love, to care and share. But yet I meet so many teenagers, you know, of all ages. And, you know, they just say, Lorna, I believe in my guardian angel, but I can't tell anyone. Hmm. You know, or, or I'm giving a talk somewhere and, you know, at the blessings, you know, it's all families. It could be teenagers and, and smaller children. And the parents turn around to me just before I start to bless the children and they say, Lorna, can you tell me their guardian angel's name? 
And I have to smile at that because I asked the child, what's your guardian angel's name or the teenager? And 9.9 times out of 10, is that the way you say it? Yeah, you can Uh, say that. The child tells me their guardian angel's name. And of course, the parents go, you know, why didn't the child tell them? Mm. But it's, it's personal to the child as well. And I always tell the teenager or the or the 10 or 12 year old, remember the name because the world can push that name out of your mind mm. by telling you there's no such thing as your guardian angel. But as a child, you know, there is, you know, because when you were an infant, you saw your guardian angel as clearly and as phys- physically as I see them today. All infants do? All infants do. Huh. And then they, I heard you say that they lose it by about the age of three or so. Yeah, because we we kind of, you know, we're brainwashing our children. I, I've been telling parents to say, if if a mother is pregnant, when your baby is born, you know, ask your baby, you know, don't just teach it to say mama, dada, you know, in that way. Ask your child as well, say, how's your guardian angel or how's your soul? Because that child will grow up more open and will do, what would I say, a lot of good in the world because they will be more compassionate, you know, will have more love to give because they won't be so afraid. Yeah, I bet you your children. I mean, did you talk about this stuff with your children as they grew up? No, Um, I didn't. I was all the time told to keep it a secret. But when... When my children, it's a real strange story, like, you know, because I couldn't read or write and my children knew it. And when the time came after my husband had died, I had said, you know, to someone I had just met, you know, a neighbor, I'm going to write. And you can imagine if I said that to you years ago and you knew I couldn't read or write, you'd probably just look at me. Well, my neighbor just looked at me and said, yeah, okay. And then I think it was, I don't know how long afterwards, but a knock came to the door. And I know I have it in the book as well. And again, it was someone I had met. Um, I can't say say names. And um, he said he had a gift for us and it was two big boxes. And I remember giving him a cup of tea and um, it was a laptop and a printer. Mm. And Dragonesh speak, you know, to speak into. And you can imagine me not even knowing how to do this. And then when I came down here to the farmhouse where I live now, um, again, someone I had just met, a husband and wife, um, a neighbor here, I just told them straight out, I wanted to write because the angel said, say it. And I said to them, I can't read or write. And I showed him this laptop and this printer and he set it all up. And he done it in such a way that he said, Lorna, you press this button and this button all the time. And that's the way it will work for you. And you just speak. Yeah. So and it just uh, dictated, you dictated it. And it yeah, yeah. And that's that's what I what I did. Um, so, you know, just because you might feel, you know, you have any, um, you're different than someone else because you're dyslexic or because you have, what do you call it, um, you know, a disability. I think sometimes someone says a disability, you know, you still can live life to the full. And I always remember when angels in my hair came out, I had so many college students in Dublin coming to the book signings and just saying, you know, you gave us great hope because I was dyslexic, you know, and it's all about giving hope. And I thank God for that every day, for every life that that has been touched or given hope give encourage, encouragement you know it's it's so important so we shouldn't no matter what faith you are or even if you say you're not of any faith it doesn't matter be the best person you possibly can be good um so we're getting short on time so i want to end this on a profound note here although the whole thing has been profound um here we go so 
you've seen many possible futures, um, both positive and negative. And um, it sounds like any one of these could eventually manifest. But at, at the end of chapter 10 of Angels in My Hair, you mentioned that you believe a day will come where all the good that exists within everyone will become triumphant and will overcome the the bad in the world and we'll have a whole different civilization. So perhaps we could talk about that in our remaining time. Um, you, you want to comment on that before I ask any more? I, I do believe that will happen. You know, um, the good in us, you know, we'll open up spiritually. That intertwining will happen, you know, um, and, and that we will become one nation. And And remember, you know, at times I speak about, you know, I have given just a few of the wonderful futures I have seen. Okay. But it's not just one of those wonderful futures. They all come together. All those positive futures come together. And I believe mankind can do it. I'm still here in the world. And by the way, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah, you, you had know, a near-death experience. Yeah. I've had more than one. Mm. I'm I'm not the ordinary human being medically in that sense. You know, um, I'm one that, that's, um, what would you say, um, can be here today and suddenly in the hospital and they don't know what to do mm. in, that, in that way. The body just crashes. Um, but God has me here, you know, and each and every one of us have to believe that we are here to to live life to the fullest and to, you know, change this world, to make it that beautiful place, like that little glimpse of heaven. And I know we can do it. And and I know in some of the futures I, I said where the children give out because they're only looking at photographs of birds, butterflies, flowers, and they're saying to us, who are here today alive, why did we destroy them all? But we already know the good part of that is that here and now at the moment, we know we have to do something to save nature. And I know we can do it. Because again, in another positive future is where, you know, the children can see through the eyes of their soul. They have intertwined completely. And mankind at the moment, in one sense, thinks that, what would I say, I have to smile, um, that we know everything almost, or that we have learned everything almost. I can assure you, you haven't. Oh, there were there, people in the 1800s who said that kind of thing. <laughs> you, I, am, I, I, just have to, I just have to smile because writing this book with the scientists and the questions they have asked and the answers I have given, you know, I'm, they're blown away by that. But in a sense, I'm, I have said, you know, but surely you knew that. And they're saying no. And now they're discovering more and more. We have so much to, it's not to learn. I know that's a human word, but it's like to discover and realize that we have, like even watching the children and what they were doing with the grass and, and how they could see it and how they could see the life of the grass, you just see grass, you know, you just look at it. But these children were seeing it and just watching them. And I know when when I say this, people think, oh, that's crazy. That's not real. When, when I say that these children, you know, walked across the river without a bridge. This was a deep river. This they is something breathe. that actually has happened now or that you envision in the future? It's, it's part of the future. I see. So they might be able to walk on water. No, they didn't actually walk on the water. You, no one has asked that question. Oh. They didn't. Why, why I say they walked across without a bridge. A bridge is always above the water. Mm -hmm. They walked across above the water. They didn't even get their feet wet. They like hovered above the water. Not, not in that, not in that way. It was like as if they were walking. But yeah. walking on the air, but not hovering. Right. You know. So, in other words, you're envisioning a yeah. time when people will have miraculous abilities, such as the kind of things Jesus did, but it will be more commonplace. But if it will be normal, normal, it's just, right? It's just like it's normal for me 
to see the angels physically, to mm-hmm. see the souls of loved ones, and so much more that I see that I don't talk about as well. Well, that sounds like fun. Um, do you have a sense of a timeline? I mean, there are some people who say, well, the way, the way climate change is going, we could have very catastrophic outcomes even within this decade. Billions of people might die. Um, you know, do you have any sense of how things are going to unfold and, and when? Well, again, I would say, you know, God has me here and I'm giving you the messages. And, you know, I I know we can do it. No matter what happens, I know we can do it. And I don't want anyone, if at all possible, to lose lose their life. I want us all to make this planet like the little glimpse of heaven. Mm -hmm. And we can start that. You know, we have already started. And I, I know a lot of people are full of fear because we don't want things to change. But things are changing. And we ourselves are changing. We ourselves are reaching inside of us to that spiritual part. It's like it's, you know, that intertwining has to start. And I believe it has already started. So to me, if I'm here in the world, there is great hope. And I don't know why. I'm just just saying that because I shouldn't be here. You know, so there's, why does God have me here? I know I'm giving them, I'm the messenger. I'm giving the messages. And they're in the books and on, you know, on different things I I do. And even the sanctuary here in Ireland, that's a complete mystery. I don't have money. And yet this has happened. You know, everything is just, it's mind blowing. But we can save this world. I know we can. I believe in you. I believe we can too. Um, I think it's not a, we can't just sort of, relax and expect it to just happen we have to do things um, to make it happen but um i do believe there's some kind of spiritual epidemic taking place in the world that is the the hope of the world well we we all have to we all have to um play our part and i i always say you know what have you got to lose you've nothing to lose in just believing you have to give yourself a chance in that that way so give it a go you have nothing to lose whatsoever. Except unhappiness and fear and things like that. You can lose well, those. <laughs> I, I would say to you, a lot of a lot of that fear and unhappiness can disappear as well. Yes, sure. You know, and once hope comes in and, and, you know, all the governments and all the people in power, you know, they can't take hope away from us. They can't take love away from us. They may be trying to do it to, in a sense, to have power and control over the world. But it's like we will triumph. I know we will. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned the sanctuary, and I was looking at your website and talking to your daughter before we started, and (laughs) you have this lovely place in Ireland there uh, at which you offer retreat retreats quite regularly. And it, it seems fairly small. So the retreats aren't hundreds of people. They're, they're fairly intimate, I gather. Yeah, th- well, we have a lot of them that are very um, intimate um, because that seems to be what people are looking for yeah. in that, that sense, smaller groups. But we will be doing bigger groups where it will be just a one day. Okay. Okay, just a one day, but yeah. smaller groups for you know, people that are coming for three or five days. And, you know, one group there I had just a little while ago, you know, I think it was, they were all teachers Mm -hmm. and they all came from America. And I, I just thought it was so beautiful because they were teachers, well educated and, and they had learned so much. They said, that what they had learned at the sanctuary over those five days is going to help them to be better teachers, but to be better people themselves, better loving husbands or loving wives or or whatever is in within their lives. And sometimes, you know, I always smile the way God seems to do it because sometimes a group could be psychologists and doctors and nurses it's like as if God gathers them all and say, here, Lorna, we, you need to talk with these people here, you know, as a small, a small group. And we do a lot more at the sanctuary as well. We get people to get back into nature, 
you know, and one thing I have been shown is that a school will be there one day, but not a school like what schools are at the moment. It's like children will come from all over the world for a few weeks at a time. Teenagers will come. And the other part, what I love is even, you know, college students will come. But it's like one part I have to smile at that God has shown me. Um, And this is where God has shown me this bus has come and they have come for, I think, four weeks or something like that. And um, in the vision I was shown was that they were getting off the bus and they were wearing good suits, good trousers, you know, good shoes. And I remember, you know, at this vision, just smiling and saying, why do they come dressed like that? Do they not know where they're going, <laughs> you know, in that way? And, you know, later on, handing them, you know, Wellington boots and saying to them, you go out and get your breakfast in the garden. They had to go out and pick their own breakfast and get their own eggs. But they were loving it. It was like spiritually companies were sending you know, their executives, their office workers to connect back spiritually to nature. And it was like as if they were being, um, what would you say, plugged in and went back and were more radiant and more full of life in that that way. It was a strange kind of vision in, in in that sense. So, I know people from all of the world will come to the sun and it will just grow. And I can't tell you everything because I don't even know myself. All as I know that in 300 years, it will still be there and more. And that's an awful long time. And the only reason it's there is because someone found the book Angels in My Hair and it had such a huge impact and miracle in the family's life that that couple went in search of us and skipping loads of the story and came to Ireland, eventually found us. And here at the farmhouse here, they, they said, Lorna, you have done so much for our family. You have saved us. We want to do something for you. So we'll build on to your farmhouse, they said, so you can see more people. But God had other plans, you know, because when we applied for planning permission, it was turned down. So that was fine. And then one day, you know, my son was saying, we have to find somewhere that we can even rent for a weekend where people can come. And so my son and another lady were looking online and the young woman sent my son a link for it was like an auctioneer, you know, selling houses. Right. And and said to my son, Niall, um, just sending you this for a laugh, you know. And um, my son looked at it and then he done the strange thing. He sent me the link on the computer and he rang me and he said, Mom, open your computer. So I pressed my buttons, opened the computer and he said, you see my name? Nile, he said, go and click on that. So I opened it and I got a terrible shock because the first thing I saw on that link were these two pillars and this gate. And that's where Archangel Michael stood years before my husband Joe died and said to me, Lorna, you will live here one day. And I remember that day and my husband saying to me, because everything went in slow motion, or you were all right. And all this I could see, the far side of those two pillars where Archangel Michael was standing was this tiny little roof. And my husband was already quite ill. And I said, no way, we can't live in that. That, you know, inside, no way. But then the video link went down a long trail Um, inside the gates and came to this big, huge old house. I think it's 16th century or something like that, 17th century. Um, And my son sent it to that couple that had come to see us and just said, you know, we don't have any money, you know, but I'm going to send, you know, I'm sending it to you anyway. And they bought it. 
So we don't have money. They they bought it. So everything that is there, others have done, which is in, incredible. And it's always related to where the impact of angels in my hair or something that I have done has, has helped within their life or within their family's life or has changed something. Or it's like, you know, I do extreme cases as well, which I don't advertise. Um, and that's, you know, where it could be a father's dying wish to come and spend time with me and then the whole family come. Mm. So the farmhouse is quite small, you know, in that in that way. Or it could be a child or it could be, you know, a whole family. It could be anything, you know. So there's a lot we do that people don't know. And of course, we have the Children's Foundation as well. And we help, we help there. But the sanctuary is just a miracle, you know, why Ireland? Why has God done it here in Ireland? Why isn't it in America? Like, you know, why hasn't the American gathering angels taken me over to America? I would say to God, like even as a child, a teenager, I would always give out to God and say to him, why didn't he make me a man? You know, why didn't he make me a man? Because I would say to God, if I was a man, I would have got more attention. You know, people would listen more. It's harder for a woman to give the message. Not to my mind. I mean, you're well, that's good. Perfect, you're perfectly first. good messenger. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's just just sharing yeah. that little story. That's with beautiful. You. I appreciate you taking the time to tell that. And who knows? Maybe you'll end up with a network of places and different continents and all. Um, I I know all that part. Okay, <laughs> that's one of those secrets you haven't told yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, Lorna. I've thoroughly enjoyed, um, you know, reading your books and listening to your videos and having this conversation with you. And um, as always, I'll put up a page on on BatGap that has some essential information, like a link to your website and links to your books. And people can go to that, you know, to your website and they'll find out much more detail about the retreats you're offering and anything else you may come up with in the future. Do you have a kind of an email list that people can sign up for to get notified of things? I, I think Pearl, see, I can't do one. I think they have right. more of that. Yeah, yeah, so they can I they can know. sign up for something like but that. But if there is ever anything I can do for you and your family, let us know. Or if you are ever coming to Ireland, let us know. All right, I definitely will. Okay. So and anything. Yeah. You know, because it's a miracle you're having us on your show. Like, so... Oh, not so miraculous. I mean, you're you're a prime candidate for this kind of thing. (laughs) I think it is a a miracle. You know, it's 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 incredible. And I have enjoyed chatting with you and everything like that. So if there's ever anything we can do, let us know. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And um and thanks to your daughter and other people who've been helping with this as a a woman in New York, I believe, um, Beth, who has been very helpful. Yeah. And yeah, it's been, is, been nice dealing with her. I saw your wife there. Did she crawl in a little while ago to get the dog? Oh, she might have. She's sitting right. She, her desk is right to my left here. She's right to your left. Yeah. <laughs> she looked beautiful. <laughs> yes, she is. She is um, very Good. So, All right. Well, thanks. I, I hope you stay in good health and live a long life because you're doing wonderful work in the world. And uh, it's been good getting to know you. We'll be. In, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, we do that. So yeah. God bless and love you. Okay, okay. thanks. Love you God too. Bye bye. I let you hang up because okay. I don't know what buttons to press. Uh, I'll, I'll press the buttons. All okay. right. <laughs> God bless. Thanks, Lorna. Bye bye. Bye.